you know, my first original job with the Muppets, which carried through all the way through with, with Jim's years was to almost, it, it was like an understudy, but, but I was a stand in for somebody like Frank. If, if Miss Piggy was in a scene and she had a lot of dialogue, I would do Fozzie because he couldn't do both of them at the same time. And then he would dub the voice, you know, or in Jerry's case, if, if Robin the frog was in a scene and Floyd was there, I would do Floyd or something like that. And so it gave me the opportunity to really learn to analyze the puppetry styles of every single other performer because they're very different because it was really important to me for whatever reason, this struck me as being important that when I did Fozzie, it needed to look exactly like Frank was doing it. There shouldn't be any difference between when Frank took it off and handed it to me, he needed to move in exactly the same way. You should not be able to tell somebody else was doing it. So it was really yeah. important to me to analyze the, and they all had different styles. Jim was different than Frank was different from Jerry. They were all different. And so I was able to learn all that. And I think all of that went into me being able to develop my own, you know, amalgamation of all those styles. Yeah. People, uh, people don't really think about that. I know, uh, uh, Muppet fans do, but a lot, like you said, a lot of people say, Oh, uh, Steve Whitmire voiced Kermit. And it's like, yeah. well, yeah. he didn't, didn't just yeah. voice him. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. People don't understand. And I, I understand the misunderstanding, but you know, when people talk about a voice being good or bad or something, they, they don't understand so often that the voice may be good or bad, but it has nothing to do with that. Uh, ultimately, the voice is, you know, just 10%. It, it's really all about, especially with, the, especially with the core original Muppets, it's, it's completely about the character. Yeah. And sometimes, you know, the Muppets miss the mark these days. And it's because of, it's, it's character, it's missing character uh, amongst many, many other things. It's um, people who have done the best they can, who are excellent performers, but they don't necessarily understand the depth of the character because they weren't in the room with the men who did it originally. And I say this a lot. A lot of people have heard me say this, but I, people talk about Jim Henson's legacy and I distinguish that, really, dis, really make a distinction between a legacy, which always feels like what Jim left us when he died, a body of work. Um, that's his legacy, as well as his philosophies and so forth. But I, I, I think the Muppets are a lineage. And, and, and the difference for that, you know, if you, any discipline, like whether you're a musician or a painter or a martial artist or any of these things are, are a lineage tradition. You, you learn from someone else the basics and then you evolve that into your own styles. And that's what I went through, uh, the lineage of how Jim did things. And I think it's, unfortunately, it's pretty much lost, um, that lineage feeling. And I think it should be the same for the core Muppet characters. Um, now new characters are a different story. You, you can, you can develop your own character, but the others needed to be continued. If they're going to be continued being passed one to the next, to the next in a singular individual sort of way, which is what happened with me. And it kind of isn't that way anymore. So when people say, Oh, you know, the voice of this character, I can't stand it since it's changed or whatever that there, there may be truth to that, but the reason you're not able to accept the voice is because you're not seeing the truth of the character. Uh, and that's, what's going to keep them alive or unfortunately not, you know, that's, that's the sad part. <laughs> yeah. Hope, hope, hopefully not the case, but yeah. Well, it's hard. I, you know, I, I know what you mean. There's kind of a perception that, and, and there's different levels of fandom too. You know, there are the very discriminating fans who really follow the Muppets and really know them. And then there are the more casual fans, which is probably the broader fan base, who just see a Muppet movie or a thing once in a while, and they they kind of have certain traits they expect in the characters. And if it's, frankly, if it's green and it hops around, then it's Kermit, you know, <laughs> um, and anyone could do that. But there are things about Kermit that people don't realize they're missing until they're gone. Um, and you know, that's unfortunate. It's too bad that has to happen. Um, so the real discriminating fans will see the difference. You know, they, they'll know, and not just Kermit, that could be any character, uh, will see the differences between 
Frank's characters and the new versions of those characters. It's, it's less a continuation and more a new version in many cases, you know, that, and that's too bad. You know, it's too bad that the characters will go on, but, but likely be not quite true to what made them such a giant success all those years ago. You know, the, the evolutionary chain of it is broken a bit. Yeah. I think a lot of that has to do with the writing too. Sometimes is, uh, a lot of the people who come in and write Muppet projects aren't necessarily Muppet people. They're, Oh, uh, I, I wrote a little something and, uh, here you go. Like Josh yep. Gad wrote a Muppet thing and they're not yeah. making it now, but yeah. it's like, Oh, who, who wants to write a Muppet project? And it's like, yeah. Oh. Yeah. And, and, and with all due respect to so many talented people, sometimes the more established and bigger name that a, a producer or writer is, um, the less likely they are to get the Muppets because they do a certain thing in a certain way and they might get hired to develop a project but they're developing a project that is faithful to them. And they've seen the Muppets and, and they know about Kermit and they know about Miss Piggy and they understand this thing, but they don't really know who the characters are. So that's, they'll write something that might be funny, but it's not necessarily true to the characters in a way that, that the fans will respond in the same right. way, especially the fans who really know the characters, you know? Yeah. You know, that, that, that's easy, easy to happen. <laughs> yeah. Um, going back to what you said about when uh, the voices change, um, yeah, did yeah. you did you experience any of that when you took over the reins as Kermit? Um, did, did anybody have? I know there wasn't. Uh, there might have been internet, but there wasn't uh, message boards, right. and people weren't right uh, weren't able to express their uh, yeah. d- their opinions on things as much. But did you experience I, any uh, backlash from people like, "Hey, that's not how Kermit sounds," or right. Kermit does this and um, there was a little bit, um, but mostly we were, we were concentrating with, with a group of us who were doing this stuff to try to think about ways for my voice to, um, mash. <clears throat> and for me, it was really a matter of, I mean, anybody can do their Kermit voice, but it's, it's funny how the voice mattered less because I was able to kind of draw on, you know, we just lost Jim. He had just passed away. And I had worked with him on pretty much everything he had done over the 12 years that, that I knew him. And I was always there, you know, in the room next to him while he was doing Kermit. And um, it, it was, what I started really doing was thinking about what parts of Kermit were actually characteristics of gems versus stuff that kind of extended beyond the things we saw in Jim into being really only Kermit more or less. But an awful lot of Kermit and the way Kermit acted and, and carried on was Jim. And there were little ways, uh, patterns of speech that Jim used in his daily life that transferred into Kermit. And when Jim was ad living with Kermit and improvising in particular, um, he talked much the same sort of tempo and uh, little asides uh, with Kermit that, that he would do if you were sitting and having dinner with him. And that, that goes back to what we were talking about a minute ago about the lineage thing, because had I not known all of those Jim Henson traits and how they overlapped into Kermit traits, I, I think it would have been so much harder um, because the voice would have been all that was scrutinized, you know? And, and, and I, if I was able to do anything well, it was to zero in on what, what, who Kermit was. And, and once I was able to draw from my experience of Jim and to a large degree, I was acting Jim. Um, Frank said that to me once in the early days, you know, he said, he said, you already know how to make a puppet work, but and, and I was already thinking this anyway, and he confirmed it for me. He said, you have to, you know, you have to become Jim to a certain degree because we all know that's the only way it's ever going to be Kermit. And you knew Jim and you were around Jim and you know what those characteristics are. So that made it possible. There wasn't a lot of public problem over it. Um, it, it went relatively smoothly. 
Um, and by the time I was doing Muppet Christmas Carol, which was the first big project we did after Jim passed away, um, I, I felt like I had dialed it in pretty well. Um, now, if you played my voice alongside Jim's from that film, it's different, of course. But I, but I knew who Kermit was. <clears throat> and that was so well written as a part for Kermit, the Bob Cratchit role, uh, that I was able to, to, to really let Kermit come through, you know. That's a great movie. I, I that's still one of my favorite uh, Muppet yeah. movies because I I think uh, for my generation at least uh, we it grew up more on uh, on Christmas Carol and Treasure Island and yeah. Uh, yeah. that sort of thing, and then went back later and realized oh, there's even more Muppets to be had. Way back, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, it's interesting. I in my mind, it, it's a whole process. It's part, just part of the performance process that can happen with puppets. I don't think it always happens with any puppets, whether it's Muppets or something else. But I felt like, I always wanted to do this, when I was watching the, because we always weren't looking at monitors, as you know, I'm sure, and we've got the puppets up here, and we're really not looking at the puppet very much. We're looking down at the screen, right? <laughs> and it, I would always have Kermit look directly into the camera and relate to him looking directly at me. So I, I, separ- I tried to separate myself from him on a certain level when I was performing him. And, and that became kind of an exercise of something I would do as I was working. And if I believed what I was seeing was separate from me, I knew I was doing a reasonably good job. And in this weird sort of, you know, mentally strange way, um, I got to a point with Kermit in latter years where when Kermit was talking, he's up here, I'm down here, and I'm watching him, and I'm seeing this thing, I started to just forget that I was doing the puppet in a funny sort of way. You know, I wasn't, I wasn't thinking about that I'm doing what I'm watching here. And my mind would kind of separate from it. And I would literally find myself in the middle of talk shows where I've got, you know, Jimmy Kimmel or Jimmy Fallon or, you know, somebody, you know, firing questions at Kermit. And I have no idea what Kermit is going to say next, not a clue. And it never enters my mind it's almost as though it's happening and then I'm getting it. Does that make it's yeah. it very weird. Uh, Kermit <laughs> was literally speaking without me thinking about Kermit speaking. And I don't think it's easy to get to that place. Uh, it takes a long time to get to that place. You're no longer thinking about I'm running. All of the technical part of the puppetry is gone. And this character is just alive, not just for the audience, but for you too. And I would just sit back and, and watch the show. You know, I don't know what I don't know what he's going to say next. You know, it, it was an amazing experience, and I would love. And I, unfortunately, I didn't have the time, uh, the chance. But I would love to have had the opportunity to try to teach that to other puppeteers within the Muppets and elsewhere. And I may elsewhere, um, but I think it's I think it's teachable, and I think it takes a lot of experience. You know, to get to that stage where that character is so alive that you're now the audience of your own character entirely yeah you know um and i and i think that's when kermit really started to to just really dial into being you know still based on jim's kermit but moving forward in a progressive sort of way you know have his old traits but coming up with some new ones you know as we move forward yeah did they uh um i i I, I doubt they had auditions for Kermit necessarily after Jim passed, but how did that right. process go in finding who would be the new Kermit after well, Jim passed? Um, there were no auditions. Evidently, um, I mean, I worked with Jim for about a dozen years at that point, and we worked closely together. And, you know, I think I stood in for Kermit once or twice, but that that had nothing to do with it. Um Jim was at the, pro, uh, at the point where he was selling his company to Disney at that point, and that fell apart, as you may know. But in 1990, he was selling the whole company. And he was coming in very much like, uh, if you know who John Lasseter was with Pixar, um, mm-hmm. as a new creative sort of force who would be installed in Disney and he would have all this opportunity to do all these projects. He was going to be just creating, 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 creating. And of course, they wanted the Muppets to go on. He did too. So 
I, uh, my understanding is he thought that he might become so busy with other work that he would no longer be able to perform Kermit. Gotcha. So apparently he had gone to his wife, Jane, and uh, I th- I th- my understanding is I think he may have said it to Frank, um, just a handful of people, and said, um, in the event this happens, you know, I, I'm not saying it's going to happen, but in the event something like this should happen, I'm, I'm considering, I'm thinking that I might ask Steve if he wants to try it, wants to become Kermit. So, but he never said this to me. I, I, we never talked about it. There was no indication that this would be happening because uh, he was toying with the idea. He hadn't, he hadn't decided he was going to not do Kermit anymore uh, or, or even get somebody else to do Kermit. And then, of course, uh, within a few months after that is when he died. So I was asked to do it based on that. Um, uh, I was asked to, to give Kermit a try. And I was offered the option of saying no. Um, you know, if you don't want to do this, we understand kind of thing. Um, but I said yes, and it was really, really an intimidating thing to say yes to. Um, you know, you've got Jim's most well-known character in the world that is the most associated with him, this leader of the Muppets who directly translates into being the leader of the company of the puppet, of the puppeteers, everybody. Um, so it was very hard, very hard, but that's, that's kind of how it came about. Yeah. I guess it, it helps though, when you know that he had you in mind and if he thought you could do it, then I guess you kind of know, like maybe, maybe I can, maybe I am up for the challenge. Well, it, it gave me a little bit more confidence, I think. Um, but it really, it all, it all, I keep repeating myself a little bit, but it all, all (laughs) boiled down to the time I had spent with him. Had I not been in the room with him and in front of him so often when, and playing opposite him when he was doing Kermit, it would have been impossible. There would be no way that I could have done anything faithful to what people know as Kermit. And it's real interesting. People get into, I see a lot of discussions online with people saying, you know, this version of Kermit versus that version of Kermit versus this other version of Kermit. And I always reject all that. And I don't mean to just say it's, it's, it's not, it's, it's understandable. I know why people are doing it. But that is an entirely objective point of view of this. That is looking at Kermit as a thing out there and saying, well, he was done by this guy, this guy, this guy, this guy, this guy, whatever. And, and I, was, I never looked at Kermit uh, that objectively. I looked at him subjectively from the inside out. And as far as I'm concerned, and, and maybe because of this experience I was just talking to you about where he suddenly was not me anymore, I really came to the conclusion that Kermit exists, existed in the world separate from me and separate from Jim. People weren't thinking about Jim Henson when he was seeing Kermit. They were thinking about Kermit. They weren't thinking about me when they were seeing Kermit. They were thinking about Kermit. And because I was able to carry it on with some with that lineage, I think people pretty quickly accepted that it was still Kermit. You know, so when people say, "Well, this version, that version," I just say they're there is no this person's Kermit and that person's Kermit. There's just Kermit. And if it's not, if, if you're thinking versions, then you're not really thinking Kermit. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. definitely. And then that's, it's interesting with the Muppets because they're really the only characters like that where you see them out in the world and you think of them as beings. They aren't yeah. char- just characters. It's, oh, they're playing a part in this movie, but here right. they are for real. And right. there's not really any other character like that. You're not like, oh, there's Charlie Brown for real. It's like every, right. uh, every yeah, the characters feel like actual people yeah. out in the world. Well, that's right. And, and I think that's because they're puppets for one thing. They're not animated. Um, I think as a fan, we all know that you can look at them. And if you were in the room with them, you could shake their hand or you could touch them or they, they, are, they are a physical thing. You know, people say, well, they're not real. Well, actually they are real. They're puppets, but they're real. They, they are a thing, you know, they're a physical object. And yeah. we, we forget about the fact that there's a, a person underneath making them work and we just suspend that disbelief. But they do exist in our, in our actual real world. Um, they never were, I mean, the Muppet Show was kind of their world, but it was a real world setting nonetheless. And they had humans there. So because they've always interacted with human beings and because they exist in a version kind of of our actual real world, and in some cases in the actual real world, 
I think we think of them as being just, you know, citizens of the world. Yeah. Yeah. And like you said, it helps. They're not animated. You can't see the actor playing them. And uh... Right. Right. Well, and, and also over the years, as we've done so much promotion with them, I think they've grown to have a life off screen that has established that even further, which means yeah. that that sort of storyline needs to stay realistic too. You know, um, there's the story within their films and their films are so close to being sort of meant to be sort of almost like real life uh, to a certain degree that it all needs to stay consistent. And that's a lineage too, really, if you think about it, you know, things evolving over time, you know, the difference between change and evolution, you know, change is just, okay, I'm going to change it now. Evolution is things that become different because they're based on something and that's still a part of them, you know, and I think that's how the Muppets need to be handled. And unfortunately, I'm not sure that's still going on <laughs> exactly. You know, there's nobody yeah. around these days. Uh, Dave is still involved, but I think he's less and less. And, you know, there's no one actually involved in the Muppets that can be in a position to put forth Jim's influence in it. So there are a few people who knew him, but they're not in a position to really put that forward. And so who knows whether the Muppets will last? I don't know. I frankly i'd almost rather see them kind of not last than to exist and not be who they are uh and i think the secret to that really is new characters you know i always pushed for the new puppeteers coming in to be given the opportunity as soon as possible to develop their own characters Um, right don't 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 put so much emphasis on we've got five characters you know uh, disney was very much about kermit piggy fozzy gonzo and animal well, th- those yeah. characters, they don't exactly, they don't all actually fit together. Animal wasn't really around Piggy and Fozzie very much because it was Frank. You know, he, he was kind of separate and he was never not with, double negative, with um, the Dr. Teeth Band. So, Vince, I mean, he, him as an independent person who moves through the world really didn't happen. Uh, and yeah, that's. I, I always thought it was weird that he was one of the top five because I, I think it's more so that animal merchandise sells you like a t-shirt with yeah. animal on it with a funny yeah. saying, but he's not yeah. necessarily a character that you're going to have a, a storyline around <laughs> necessarily. It, it, it was a, it was a character direction based entirely on marketing data and not yeah. on, and not on characters points of view, not on characters relationships. So, you know, I mean, all that stuff's going to happen, but um yeah, it was very weird. Very weird. The minute, you know, Floyd always had animal on a chain. The minute he wasn't on a chain anymore, to me, it didn't make sense. He was an animal. He was a dangerous fellow, you know. <laughs> you know, he doesn't go to the store by himself or out with other people particularly. You know, it doesn't make sense. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Were there ever ever any projects, and not necessarily with uh, Disney, but just yeah. in general with the Muppets, that you ever, any projects you ever worked on where you're like, this really isn't working. I mean, we, we got to finish it, but it's not, not really meshing. It's not. Yeah. Sometimes, sometimes a script can just not quite hold together and the characters may be, you know, pretty much in character, but it's maybe just not a great story. Um, But in, in the, with some of the more recent stuff we were doing, it's not so much that the characters were all wrong although in some cases they were wrong. Um, It was that we could have done the same story, uh, you know, and and, and added little twists and turns here and there that would have kept them more being who they were. I I had a real um, kind of a problem with Kermit living in a mansion in Hollywood. Um, I thought it was all wrong. Jim always maintained, as did I, that Kermit, lived in the swamp when he wasn't working, went back to the swamp. I maintained that for years and years and years before we did that particular film. And I really so hard tried to get them, if they needed to do it from the other characters' perspectives, I wanted, I just tried to come up with a way not to alter the story, not to say your story is terrible. So how can we do this so that it gives what you want and still is true to Kermit? I had this idea that Kermit would be uh, there would be a, a lot in Hollywood that has this thing that looks like a big mansion. And when you walk through the, through the front door, it's a Hollywood flat. So from the outside world, it looks like Kermit lives in a mansion, but actually he walks straight through the door, like an old Western set in Hollywood. He walks straight through and jumps in a pond. I, I thought that solved the problem. 
And when Walter I, and, and Jason Siegel and, and Amy and those guys, those characters came in, they think, wow, Kermit lives, it would be a silly joke. He lives in a mansion, but he doesn't actually live in a mansion. You know, he lives, he's, he's there because it, you know, this is what Hollywood people do and I have to play the game and, you know, I under, you know, kind of thing. I thought that was so much more Kermit. I like that a lot, actually. I never. Yeah, it, it, it was in character, you know, it was in character. And yet from, from the point of view of these three fans who migrated to Hollywood to meet him, it still serviced the story. There was so much of that. Uh, um, I felt like the uh, idea that the characters were separated in that film was a little odd. I know why they did it. They wanted a device where they could show all these different things that the characters were doing. Yeah, I think the real get the band back together kind of story. Yeah. But my fundamental problem with it was that on a very fundamental level, it felt to me like while the characters might be off doing other things, the reason they were separated is because they had had disagreements. That to me felt wrong. Um, I could see a situation where Kermit would say, you know, you guys go off and Gonzo, you're going to do, you know, um, vaudeville theater and Fozzie's going to do a stand-up. All of that would be okay. And those were funny things. But I had a real problem with the reason that, that Kermit and Fozzie had had a fight. There, there was no way. There was no way those two characters would have a fight. That's a true. It, yeah. it just made no sense to me. So why, why did we have to do that? You know, I mean, stuff like that. So, so I, it wasn't that I thought the projects were bad or that the people doing them didn't have the absolute best intentions for the Muppets and love those characters. I just felt like the stories could have been formed into something that stayed a little more in character for what we would expect from all that we already know about the Muppets, you know, 